We'll get started 10 seconds early tonight. How's that? Everybody okay with that? <laughs> hey, man, I hope your week has been going well. Uh, a little bit of a surprise looking out the window around dinner time and seeing huge snowflakes coming down and the temperature dropping about 20 degrees. I guess that is late March and not that unusual in our neck of the woods, but uh, I'll be glad when it's 60 and 70 and nothing but, at least for a short while. Well, this uh, Sunday evening, the Wager family is going to be joining us, our missionary of the, uh, the month. That's actually in April. Uh, we kind of arranged things to get Josh in here since he's back from Micronesia. His wife had a baby, if you may remember, at the end of last year. And they're wrapping up their deputation. So I'm gonna, I pulled out the latest prayer letter I had from the Wagers, and this was in January. So it's a little bit older, but I just wanted to share a few things from it so maybe you can kind of prime the pump for things to talk about Brother Josh when you see him here on Sunday evening. And uh, so this is Josh and Sarah and their children, uh, Melinia and Uriah. And so he says toward the end of this letter, I've, if we've learned anything over the last six years, it's that we must pray hard, seek the way of the Lord, and hold our plans loosely. Right now our desire is for me to head back to Chuuk in May to do some work in the house and possibly gym in preparation for my family's return. I will then return to the States to officiate my brother's wedding, and then, Lord willing, my family and I will return in June. Though this is still about five to six months away, we have a considerable amount of work to be done uh, now, uh, between now and then, and one of the time will pass quickly. As I draw this update to a close, I wanted to share a transparent prayer request with you. As you know from our communication before, we are still unsure as to how the Lord will prepare the way for us to re-enter re Chuuk. As we enter these final months of furlough and try to prepare for our return, we are needing the Lord to show us a clear direction. Though we have moments of doubt and fear, we trust the Lord has shown us, uh, uh, we trust what the Lord has shown us in the light and believe what he will, that he will provide a way. Please be praying that the Lord makes the way clear, that we'll be able to know the Lord's will so that we can properly prepare and plan, and that in all things he receives the glory. I don't know, I don't know for sure what the Lord will do, but we do trust his plan uh, and will be, made, will be made known to us soon because we believe in the promises of James 1.5. Uh, please, brethren, ask for wisdom. Uh, if, any of you, ask, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberty, upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. For those who of you will see soon at the church. We look forward to seeing you. So that's us. For those that we have already seen, we're grateful for the encouragement. For those that we will not be able to cross paths with on this furlough, we're grateful for your love and support from afar. Thank you to each of you who have faithfully uh, petitioned the Father on our behalf. Uh, we are deeply and eternally grateful. So Josh and Sarah Wager, uh, greet them warmly as you always do this Sunday evening and let them know that you're interested and excited about the ministry there. And maybe he'll have the answer to that prayer request about how the Lord is preparing the way for them to return legally into this uh, country. And then uh, before Pastor Bill comes up and shares a few pictures from India, as well as leads our music tonight, uh, this is a card that we received from Sister Carolyn Wojnarowski, and I just wanted to share it because it's addressed to the church family. It says, thank you for all your um, love uh, for all you have done in word and in deed, your, prayer, uh, your prayers, your visits, your calls have helped me so much uh, through this very difficult time. With much gratitude and thankfulness, I thank you in the name of Jesus. A special thank you to all the ladies who helped um, during the reception time at the funeral. With much love and with a thankful heart, Carolyn. So continue to pray for Sister Carolyn as she, uh, for a long time, as you can imagine, will, will mourn the loss of Brother Marion. And um, as, especially this week, we're doing the, the uh, screen fast and maybe have found a little bit more time to maybe think of people that want to encourage. Certainly do not forget Sister Carolyn. She needs the love of her church family to let her know how much we do care that we're praying for her, that we're trying to encourage her. And, and so reach out to her this week and let her know how much you care for her. All right, Brother Bill. 
Just wanted to give you a quick update since we aren't, some of us aren't keeping up with Randy and Kelly online this week. They celebrated the 10th graduation of the Ukrul Baptist Theological College. And so we have a couple of pictures just real quick up there. You can see Brother Randy. Uh, you can tell it's him because he's, he's the only tall white guy on the platform. And you can see that he's going through handing out all of, and this is inside of one of the new buildings. And you can notice that the walls are actually concrete instead of tin, which is a huge upgrade. You can see that the chapel sort of shares with the library in the back. And then one more, you can see them lined up alongside of one of the buildings getting ready to, to head in. That's Ningwon there in the, in the white robe. And of course, Randy and Kelly, and they're having a wonderful time with our friends. And so we praise the Lord for all that God is doing there. If you're able to, would you stand with me as we sing tonight? We're going to sing number one, My Savior's Love, up on the screens or in your hymnal, number one. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he much. You may be seated as we head over to Beneath the Banner of the Cross, 447, the Banner of the Cross. <clears throat> There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, well as ransomed ones we sing. Marching on, marching on To everything but loss And to crown him king Toil and sing beneath the banner of the cross Though the foe may rage and gather as the flood Let the standard be displayed And beneath its folds as soldiers of the Lord For the truth be not dismayed, marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but the loss, and to 
Crown him king, we'll toil and sing Neath the banner of the cross Over land and sea, wherever man may dwell Make the glorious tidings known Of the crimson banner, now the story tell Well, the Lord shall claim his own Marching on, marching on count everything but the laws and to crown him king toil and sing beneath the banner of the cross when the glory dawns tis drawing very near it is hastening day by day then before our king the foe shall disappear and the cross the world shall sway marching on count everything but laws and to crown him king will and sing beneath the banner of the cross happiness is the lord 188 happiness is the lord now this is this is a hard song to sing if you're looking like it's a wednesday so we're going to have to pretend it's not we have to be happy in the Lord, get our eyes upon the Lord Jesus instead of the rest of the week, and sing this with some joy on our faces. Happiness is the Lord. We're going to go ahead and sing the whole thing, I think. Let's do the verses and the chorus, all right? Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness and be in close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops start. I found the secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be born. Excellent singing. Thank you so much for that. Pastor Steve. Thank you, Brother Bill. Pastor Bill can preach amazing messages. He can lead music like he's a professional. <laughs> oh, we're thankful for our pastor. And uh, he asked me to bring the message tonight in uh, Acts chapter 5 in your Bibles. Or if you have one, if you don't have one, there's there one there in the pew in front of you. I hope you're happy tonight. Happiness is the Lord. I was telling a few of the folks uh, how my happy week began here at church this week. I showed up Monday morning at about 7.30, and uh, there was a box by the two front glass doors. That's not very unusual because Nehemiah's network, people are always dropping stuff off. We just had a really bad tornado go through Mississippi, and they're preparing a load to take down to there next week, I believe. And, uh, but this box had some holes cut in it. And I thought, there is something in that box that's alive. And that's never happened in the 24 years I've been coming to this church. I've never came in the morning to a box there. So I went and found some scissors and um, opened the box. And there was zero noise coming out of the box. I thought, for sure, this thing, whatever is in here, if it was alive, it's probably dead. Because there was nothing going on. Well, I got the, the box opened, and I pulled the top of it apart a little bit. And there was a little kitten huddled in the corner that someone had dropped off in the middle of the night. And uh, so being the softy that I am, I called Abby and said, you gotta come and get this cat that's been left at the church. And so now we have a new member to the Williams family. His name is Jack, Jack in the box. <laughs> and so I told Abby when she leaves home, she's taking, you're taking this cat with you. So, uh, but he's a sweet little guy, happy. I mean, very gentle and loving and happy to be rescued and, and uh, made me happy today, this week. So, 
Well, I heard a story on the radio last week. As I was preparing for this message, it really, uh, I think, kind of hit home and, and related to this passage we're going to look at in Acts chapter 5. And uh, the younger crowd that's here, may, and you know, there's several here that are college age or just past college age, and some of us not so much. But uh, maybe you experienced this. But uh, this story really uh, touched me because it, it does depict how things are in our world today, especially in uh, higher institution of higher education, higher learning. And so it's about a young college student who goes off to college. He's in his first class and kind of taking it all in, scared and wondering what to expect and how he's going to do in college and so forth. And immediately he found himself in a situation that he had been warned about. How would he respond? Would he do the right thing? So the class begins with a professor coming in, had all the students sit in a circle, and he began by saying a, very, a statement in a very strong and a very unfriendly way. He said, my class, my way. My class, my way. I don't need people questioning anything I say in this class. And if that's you, you don't belong here. And so you might as well just leave right now. Because if that's you and you don't leave, I'll probably end up removing you from this class at some point before the semester's done. Can you imagine sitting there on your first day of class and a professor comes in like that? You'd, I mean, you would be taken aback for sure. Well, quite a sobering first day of college for this young man. And as he's telling this story, they notice there's a fishbowl sitting in the middle of the circle. And the professor says, now this is kind of a test here. I'm going to have to leave the room for a few minutes. I've got to take care of something. I don't want anyone moving, and I don't want anyone saying anything to each other. I just want you to sit here. And so he walks over to the fish bowl, and he takes the fish, and he, lay, he removes them from the bowl, and he lays it on a napkin next to the fish bowl, and he leaves. And so here are these college students sitting in the circle. They're watching this little fish flap around on the napkin. And 30 seconds goes by. And they're watching this happen and they're wondering, again, you can imagine what they're wondering. What do I do? Do I do something? A, a minute goes by. The fish is still flapping, struggling for air. And after almost two minutes, this young man gets up. And he says, forget the professor, I'm saving the fish. And he walks over there and he picks up the fish and he puts the fish in the bowl. The fish starts swimming around. He's going to be okay. Um, so the professor comes back in and he says, this, is a this was a test to show you how so many people are today. We're so afraid to do the right thing because of the consequences. Or we're, we're just afraid to stand up for what we know is right. So it was all a ruse, the professor. That wasn't, he was acting in a way he wasn't normally. The way he said, that's not how things are gonna be in my class. Be the one, do the right thing. Uh, challenge thoughts that uh, need to be challenged. Ask questions, but do the right thing. Even if there are hard consequences, do the right thing. I had an opportunity to share a message in here about a month ago, and I mentioned that there were several truths that, uh, that the Lord has just instilled in my heart over the years. And I realize some of these things come from experience, they come from living a life, they come from having experienced challenges and difficulties and blessings and so forth. I can relate, although it's been many years ago, to this college student who I remember sitting in my first religion class in a secular college and sitting under a PhD professor in religion and an 18 year old kid saying certainly this guy knows what he's talking about I mean he's dedicated his life to the study of religion and he started turning my world upside down saying things like Jesus uh, Mary wasn't a virgin 
It wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. They, the, the water didn't split, they just got bogged down. And, and, and I'm hearing all this stuff and, and you know, the bells and whistles are going off and saying, no, and I wanna say, no, that is, that's not right. But as a, as a young person entering college and they're thinking, when do I open my, when, when do I do something? When do I say something? You know, I'm here on a scholarship. My grades have to be a certain level or I lose that scholarship. And, and do I just kind of fly under the radar? And do I, again, there's a, there's a real struggle there. And, and you do have to pick those battles, especially in a college situation, professors in a position of power and authority and, and um, can make or break situations. But uh, I was saying there are a number of things the Lord's taught me over the years and I mentioned them in that message a number of weeks ago, and these are not profound, but they're very simple, but they're, they become anchors in my life. Um, no doubt, uh, no, no wavering in this. I, I know these to be true. God is good. Amen? I know that. God is good. Uh, life is short. Uh, as I get older uh, and approach 60 here soon, it's getting shorter and faster. Every day is a gift. People matter more than things. You can accumulate things, but what really matter are people and the relationships that you've built. This world is not my home. Praise God for that. This world is not my home. Again, an anchor, something God has, has given me. Give God your best. You've heard me talk about that a lot over the years. He's worthy of nothing less than my very best. I want to give him my best, not my leftovers. Um, even the hard times are meant for my good. The difficult times that I don't understand, that I struggle with, that God is sovereign, that he is in control. He is God and I am not. And uh, even when I don't understand what's going on, I can trust him. When things don't make sense, when things are spinning out of control, I know I can trust in my God. And then I didn't mention this, but I would add this as well. Do the right thing. Just simply do the right thing. And uh, I do think some of these lessons get easier or Maybe easier to take that stand as we get older and we have more life experience, but it's not always easy to do the right thing. You'll hear things like, well, we've no, never done it that way before, or we don't want to set a precedent, or coming from the telephone company where I was there for 13 years where everything had a very detailed policy and procedure man manual. We had binders upon binders about how to do everything, and I heard many times, well, that's not what the policy and procedures manual says to do. And, um, or somebody say, you know, I don't wanna make waves. I don't wanna cause trouble. I don't wanna get in trouble. So I'm just gonna fly under the radar, but uh, doing the right thing is often hard. And uh, it will cause trouble, it will make waves. It will even get you in trouble, but do it anyways. And you'll see how that relates to the passage as we get into this. Do it anyway. So let's look at how this plays out in the life of the disciples tonight. Acts 5, beginning in verse 17, and we're going to read down through verse 33. The Bible says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they, all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple uh, to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. Uh, but the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the, not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors, but when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, 
we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight as we look at this passage. Show, show us individually what it is that you would have us to do, how we can apply this, these truths, these principles that, that we'll pull out of here to our lives. Thank you for the great example of the apostles, Lord, who did the right thing, even knowing it was going to cost them something, even possibly their very lives. Thank you for their obedience. And Lord, again, be with us tonight as we look at this passage in your word. Father, we love you. Bless this time now in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, Pastor Bill preached from verses 12 through 16. And I always like to just, since we're going through the entire study of the book of Acts, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter here, I like to kind of connect this. So I uh, just want to read quickly verse 12 through 16, as well as the uh, application points from last week. Verse 12 says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And the believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. So you get this idea that multitudes are being impacted by the work of the disciples, the work of the apostles, and many are getting saved, and, and those that are coming are getting healed. Just the very shadow of Peter being cast upon them was enough to bring healing to whatever ailment that they were dealing with. So last week, in a very similar to what we'll be looking at this week, at least in terms of an application, but last week, publicly share the gospel despite the trouble it might get you that it might bring you. So again, do the right thing. Share the gospel. Be obedient to, to do what God has called us to do. We looked at honor God's man and the, the honor that, that the disciples were given by those who were um, coming to hear the message and receive healing. And then pray to God for miracles with confidence. And the miracles started a long time ago and, and they were exploding and they're going to continue to explode even as we look at the passage here this evening. So you can see these are the events that led up to verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. So these religious leaders, the high priest and those that were, were with him, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, this governing council, were filled with indignation. And so what does that word mean, indignation? Well, it means to have anger, anger aroused by something perceived as being unjust, or mean or unworthy. It's anger mixed with contempt, abhorrence, scornful displeasure. The effect of indignation is judgment, punishment, and violence. And so these of the council were indignant about what was happening, what, the, what was being done. Obviously, we know how the Lord was working through them to draw multitudes to a saving knowledge of Christ or multitudes to be healed. And they weren't a part of that, and they hated every second of it. And so they're indignant. And so bottom line, what were they indignant about? Well, sick people were getting healed. I mean, if you look at it at a face value, sick people were getting healed, and that made them angry because they had no part in that. It wasn't them that, were, that was getting the glory and the honor. And so they were indignant. They were not getting healed by them. And this crazy group of Jesus followers were doing these signs and wonders and they were so filled with jealousy and anger that they simply could not see God at work. And that's really the sad part about this. These were supposedly men of God, and God was at work in an amazing way, and they missed every bit of it. Again, I challenge us to think, are you seeing God at work today? Do you see God at work today? Don't miss what God is doing around us. Yes, this is an evil world. Yes, Horrible things continue to happen. Yes, the devil is still active in carrying out his mission, 
but God is at work, and amazing things are happening, and don't miss it. And kind of our Sunday school lesson from this past week, uh, at least the adult classes, see what, find out what God is doing and get in on it. Join him in what he's doing. And so this council organized deliberate opposition to the truth and the grace of God. And they did it under the guise of religion. And religious hatred is such a horrible thing. And they, they, again, completely missed what God was doing here. Verse 18. And laid, hands on, and laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Uh, another example of doing the right thing, the obedient thing, the thing that God has called them and us to do, leading to severe consequences. Uh, again, an application of what Pastor Bill mentioned last week, of publicly sharing the gospel despite the trouble that it may bring you. So the apostles were treated like criminals and they were put in jail. And the apparent plan was to put them in jail overnight, reconvene everyone that needed to be a part of this council to have a trial, to, to bring the apostles before they disobeyed their commands, to not preach and teach in this name, and they just continued to do this. And something has to be done. And uh, so they put them away while they can pull all this stuff together. And they're going to convene a swift and, and uh, trial that would bring about swift action that was going to be taken against the apostles and with the, the leaders of this movement finally incarcerated harsh judgment could be meted out this troublesome group of, of troublemakers could once and for all be stopped and an end uh, of this threat to the way they think things should be would be cared for but god had other plans right god had other plans that's what they thought but that's not what god intended to happen here so verse 19 but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. And so divine intervention, another amazing miracle wrought by the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God of the universe. When you think about it, again, as made reference, God is doing amazing miracles uh, even today. I mean, as you look back at the, the ministry of Jesus and, and then now as Jesus was crucified and resurrected and ascended, uh, it just carries on. It's as if Jesus had not even left the work that the apostles began carrying out and the, the miracles that they're, that they're uh, seeing wrought through their faithful ministry of the word. And again, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, all those are just perplexed because it's as if Jesus never even left. And so miracles are still happening. And uh, miracles are happening today. God is still clearly at work, and yet so many of us miss it. And again, I would just reinforce what I said a moment ago. Don't miss what God's doing. And let me bring, don't miss what God is doing in our church. Don't miss it. God is at work, and in some amazing ways, in some people's lives, don't miss it. Get in on it. Don't sit back and, and think, where is God in this? God is at work right here in our midst. And so join him in that. Um, praise God for what he's doing. God is a miracle-working God. Anytime someone trusts Christ as their Savior, that in and of itself is a miracle. Rescued from the very fires of hell and changed into a new creation. And to watch these new creations begin to bloom and to blossom and to, to, to oh, faithfully do what God is telling them and called them to do is an, is an amazing thing. And that should get us all so excited to praise our Savior and keep doing what we can to, to replicate, to be a, an instrument, a vessel of a miracle-working God. Well, verse 20, and this is really from, from prison to preaching. And so the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And so they were not set free from the prison to, to run and hide and find a safe place to get away from this council that wanted to, uh, to, to do them in. And again, think the things that may have went through their mind as those men are in that prison, uh, arrested again by the council. They've already been warned not to speak and to, and to preach in, in the name of Jesus, and yet here they are again. I mean, maybe they really mean business. Maybe it's my turn to be crucified. Maybe it's my turn for my life to end. 
And uh, again, all these thoughts naturally go through someone's mind when they find themselves in a very difficult situation, incarcerated. But um, God didn't deliver them for their safety. No, they were instructed to return to the very place that they had just been arrested in and to keep doing the exact same thing. Open your mouth, speak, and to teach uh, all about Jesus. To tell, uh, and I love how this says, says this here, to, uh, to the people all the words of this life. So speak, proclaim, teach without fear. Be courageous, be bold, preach. And what was the message? Again, they were to speak to the people all the words of this life. The gospel message of salvation. Simple as that. The glorious message of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, not holding back, again, not being fearful, but to boldly open their mouths to make known the mystery of the gospel. And again, that's for us today as well. So, verse 21, and when they that heard that, uh, they, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. And so, immediate obedience. Uh, Perhaps the temple wasn't open when the, when the prison was, was opened up and they were set free. Perhaps they went and took a nap and got some rest, but they obeyed. They obeyed fully. They obeyed completely. They obeyed without hesitation. And as soon as the temple was open and available to get in there, early in the morning they went in and they began to carry out the mission that the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, had told them to do. Now imagine watching these next events unfold. It had to be almost comical, if, uh, at least if you were a believer and you knew what, how God was at work here. So in the middle of verse 21, but the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and they're getting all the people ready. They're gonna be, be able to hear the case and make judgment and bring sentence upon these apostles and put it into their, all the trouble they're, they're causing here. And they sent to the prison to have them brought. But, verse 22, when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told. Can you imagine being one of them? Walking back to the Sanhedrin council with some really bad, unfortunate, unwelcome news. I mean, you're thinking, heads are going to roll. Maybe my head's going to roll. This is not good. And uh, so they're not there. They're gone. Um, do you think they were maybe even a little bit more indignant? Maybe it was going to boil over into a whole new level of indignation. Uh, but the amazing thing is the doors, again, verse, verse 23, saying the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. And so the doors were locked. The guards are still there in place but the prisoners are all gone. <laughs> they had flown the coop, so to speak. And uh, it appeared unexplainable, except that that's another one of these miracles. All these miracles keep happening, signs and wonders. This just doesn't happen. How on earth could they have escaped? Locked doors, guards in place, guards not even knowing anything happened. This wasn't just one man that somehow escaped. And again, think about it, this is 12 men. It wasn't just one man. I mean. One can get away much easier than 12. All 12 of them are gone, a dozen men, and nobody knew where they were. Again, imagine being the ones that had to share the news with the Sanhedrin. Uh, again, they had to be very fearful. Uh, would their wrath that they are about ready to pour out on the apostles would be poured out on us, the guards, the messenger, so to speak. Verse 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereinto this would grow. So, is the Sanhedrin starting to see the writing on the wall here? Are they starting to see that this so-called movement was just not going to be able to be stopped? Another unexplainable miracle has taken place. Will it ever end? It appears that they had a moment where they realized that the growth of Christianity that they were seeing was truly beyond their ability to squelch, to stop. And this must have pierced them deeply. But would it cause them to lay aside their opposition 
and join them. Embrace, maybe Jesus really was the Messiah. Maybe all this, all these things that are happening and I've missed it and I've been confused about how this whole idea of Judaism should work, but unfortunately I would say the answer is a big no for most of them. They had rejected John the Baptist and saw that he would be killed. They rejected and killed Jesus. And uh, it's clear, especially because we know the rest of the story looking forward, that they would continue to fight the apostles. They might have their doubts about their ability to prevail against them, but they're going to fight. And they're going to keep fighting. They might lose, but they're going to go down fighting. And again, how sad and how unfortunate that is to be so close to the very, the, the, the very truth. And that's you know, I talk about that college professor, his name was Dr. Carl Scrady. Um, as liberal as a theologian could be, this was this man. And uh, as I was working my way through that very first Religion 101 class, which was a prerequisite at this college I was at, it wasn't long before I had such sorrow for this man and saying how sad that you would devote your entire life to the study of religion, but have no idea whatsoever who Jesus Christ really was and, and what he had done for you. And that was sad. And, and my guess is this man probably is in hell today. He's not on, on, on this earth any longer. And unless his eyes were opened and enlightened and he humbled himself to, to express his need for a savior, um, that's probably where he's at. I did not tell him about my savior. I know that for sure. And that saddens me as well. I was a fearful 18-year-old kid, not wanting to make waves, cause trouble, get kicked out of school, you know, that sort of thing. And so I understand the struggle that some folks have with that, especially younger kids today. And so, um, verse 25. Then came one, again, the, the, imagine the Sanhedrin processing all of this. Is this a losing battle, but we're not going to, we're going to keep fighting? And then finally someone comes, verse 25, and then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Wow. <laughs> Thought they'd be hiding somewhere, right? You know, trying to save their own skin. But nope, they're right back where they were when we arrested them just hours before. And so uh, what are they going to do? Well, again, I, I think of the, the apostles here. First off, I just say, praise the Lord for their faithfulness. Again, what can we learn from this? Their faithfulness, their boldness, their courage, their obedience. The messenger came and said, go speak, tell. And that's exactly what they did. But this had to be more salt in the wound for the council. Killing Jesus didn't put an end to the movement. And you've probably heard the saying, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You know, people think, I'll put an end to this when I finally, once and for all, shut this person up through death, and it just causes, the blood that's spilt just causes the church to explode. And again, we saw that last week in Pastor Bill's message. Multitudes are responding. We've already seen thousands more than once respond to the gospel and get baptized after Christ had resurrected and ascended into heaven and, and the apostles are faithfully carrying out the work God has called them to. And um, things are just going to continue to explode. But again, here's the religious council, and then here are these ignorant, unlearned fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, and they were doing the exact same things that Jesus did. And they were attracting an enormous following. Threats didn't work. Imprisonment didn't work. Even killing them didn't work, they've learned. At least you would think they would have learned that. And so here they were right back in the temple doing the very thing, the right thing, that they were told not to do. Verse 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. So arrested once again. And again, I, I love the example of the apostles here that demonstrated meekness, strength under control. 
in this situation because they could have easily mustered support from the crowd that would have proved harmful, harmful to those that were coming to arrest them again. Again, we see from this passage, they were fearful of that happening, that the crowd would turn on them and that they would stone them. But the disciples went in humility uh, to, to those, those that were coming to arrest them again. They complied peacefully, without resistance, without violence. How? Well, because they knew God was in control. Again, I said earlier, one of the lessons God has taught me is God's sovereign. He is God. I am not. He is in control. I can trust him even when I don't understand what's happening. I know the character of my God. I've learned it over the course of my life, and I'm going to choose to believe him and trust him even when all hope seems lost. So they knew God was in control. He was the one that was calling the shots here. He already shown them that he could rescue them out of a locked jail that no one even ever could figure out, you know, the guards didn't know, the doors were still locked. I mean, he had shown them over and over again how powerful he was. So they departed once again to stand before the Sanhedrin council. Verse 27 and 28. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Sound like they had a bit of a guilty conscience here? Matthew 27, 25. This is right before Christ's crucifixion. The response was, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. It wasn't long before they were saying, hey, we'll take responsibility. His blood's on us. And now saying, hey, you're saying, you, you're trying to say his blood is on us? Again, they, uh, they know there's conviction there. They can't hide from what they've done. And so the command that they had given them, speak not, teach not, preach not in the name of Jesus, uh, was a command that ultimately had no authority over the disciples. And the, the, the apostles knew it. And they certainly were not going to obey it. And you can tell just by their attitude, they're not ugly about this. Even the, the way that they were arrested and brought peacefully to the council and uh, the Sanhedrin had never been up against a group of ragtag, unlearned, ignorant fishermen. That's who, not, that's who they were. They were not fighting these men. They were fighting God himself. They were fighting the spirit of God. And it was the spirit that was empowering the apostles to preach and to heal and to do all these things with, with such power and authority. And it was the spirit that was working with them to lead multitudes to respond to the gospel message in saving faith. And the Sanhedrin and all of Israel's religious leaders were on a collision course with the wrath of God. And just like every other unrepentant, unregenerated sinner is that has ever lived. And unless they would repent individually of their sin and trust in Christ as Messiah, as their Savior, then they would all experience the wrath of God. And that's as true today as it was thousands of years ago when this is written. And so verse 29, and what a beautiful verse this is. Maybe it's one that if you don't have memorized that you should concentrate on trying to memorize now. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. What a bold and powerful statement. And again, it's a statement that we need to embrace today. There's a higher court than the Sanhedrin. There's a higher court than the U.S. Supreme Court and any other purveyor of man-made laws and justice. And these courts and councils have no authority to forbid them or us to preach the gospel message in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's a message we should never stop preaching, speaking, telling others about, about this glorious life that exists. No, the the apostles derive their authority from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the highest authority in heaven and in earth. And these emboldened, spirit-filled men said, we will obey God. Amen? Will you say that tonight? We will, I will, obey God. I'll do the right thing, 
even when everything seems against me. Verse 30 goes on, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, and hanged on a tree. And so in verse 28, the Sanhedrin accused the apostles of wanting to bring the blood of Jesus upon their, their heads, placing the blame of his death on them, which was, again, clearly owned up to in the events leading up to his crucifixion. But the boldness of the apostles continues. They preach to the council. They continue to level the crime of killing the Messiah at the feet of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. Indeed, they had grossly sinned against the God of our fathers, the true and living God of Israel, by falsely accusing him and seeing that he was killed and hanged on a tree. They had committed the ultimate crime against the God of their fathers. But God, God raised up Jesus and once again, their diabolical plan had backfired, and it backfired in a big way. Verse 31, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus did not stay in the grave, amen? And boy, what a glorious time we enter into on the calendar every year as we're approaching it over this next uh, couple of weeks. Jesus arose he has been exalted by God to sit on the right hand as, of God as prince and as savior in his ministry to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we have seen these things. We are witness of these things, the apostles say clearly. And if you would only be honest, you cannot deny it yourself. You've seen these things as well. Just open your eyes. It's not too late. You can believe and repent and be forgiven. Again, the message is the same message we proclaim today, the same truth that we proclaim today. But if you don't, if you choose not to, understand that your fight is no longer with us. It's with the God of our fathers. It's with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that now indwells those of us who have believed and been forgiven. So believe and repent and obey. It wasn't too late for them at this point. It's not too late for anyone under the hearing of my voice tonight. Would you do that today? How would, how would you respond? How have you responded? Well, verse 32 says, We are witness of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obeyed him. And then verse 33, And when they heard that, and this is so sad, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They had a choice, and they chose not to, not to submit, not to humbly bow themselves to say, Lord, I am a sinner, please forgive me. They said, even though it's not worked over and over, they said, we've got we've to kill them. We've got to get rid of them. That will put an end to it. And again, they miss God in all of this. They, they miss the futility of trying to kill God's servants Again, just go back to that thought, you know, the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. I mean, it just will continue to explode as more and more. And pretty soon, as we continue through Acts, we'll be introduced to Stephen and one of the first martyrs of the church and how God used that ultimately for his glory. So they had a chance to repent. Instead, they chose to reject. How tragic, how sad that is. So how can we apply these things? And there's many things here, and hopefully you pulled these out. The Holy Spirit has shown you something in the course of, uh, of looking at these verses tonight. A few things just to bring to mind, and, and the first is rather obvious. We've talked about it already, but essentially do the right thing. Do the right thing. Choose to do the right thing. Again, tying it back to last week, even when you know the consequences are going to be hard and difficult, and you're going to make waves, and you're going to get in trouble, but can I again remind you God is in control. God is sovereign. He's got a plan. When you think, I can't put myself out there, i got to fly under the radar, but God is leading you to do the right thing. Choose to do the right thing. How do I know when to do the right thing? And again, this is just a short list. I came up with nothing. It's not all-encompassing, but uh, to meet a need that someone has. When you see someone in need and you're able to, to meet it, do it. Do the right thing. To help someone who may not deserve it. Boy, this is hard. Uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly this judging spirit comes into our thoughts. Well, if they were just a little bit more faithful, then we could help them. 
do the right thing, even if they don't deserve it. I didn't deserve anything from the Lord. I didn't deserve forgiveness. I didn't deserve an eternal home in heaven. I didn't deserve the gift of the Holy Spirit that indwells me. I was a dirty, rotten, Christ-rejecting, self-righteous sinner. At 11 years old, that's some of the worst kind, right? You know, think you have all the answers. I thought I was good. No, I wasn't. Um, do the right thing when no one's watching. I struggle with this. I was in the youth room about two months ago, scrubbing a huge coffee stain out. And uh, on my hands and knees, in the middle of the week, and you know what I thought crossed my mind? I hope someone comes in here and sees me on my hands and knees cleaning this carpet. I want somebody to see me serving the Lord. Yeah, that's one of your pastors. <laughs> God, still working on me. He still has to change me and cleanse me and show me that um, I can never earn favor with God. And I want to please him. I don't want to be a pleaser of men. And so do the right thing when no one's watching. The Lord's always watching, right? The Lord knows. Do it as unto the Lord. And um, I've had to ask the Lord for forgiveness many times for having an attitude like that. Do the right thing when it's going to please God, even if we know it's going to upset someone or even break a rule. If it will please God, especially his word makes it very clear at times what's going to please him. Uh, even if we're going to upset someone, and we don't set out to upset anybody. We don't set out to offend anybody. At least that should not be our heart. I had a boss at the phone company that just loved to cause, stir the pot, cause trouble. And he would just throw something in every, every once in a while, like every week, just because he knew it was going to stir the pot and make people angry. He just th he thrived on that. That's not what we're to do here. Uh, because God tells us to. Do the right thing because God tells us to. We ought to please God rather than man. We're going to obey God rather than man. So do the right thing. Number two, stand. Simply stand. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Or you could say the threats or actions of our enemies are ultimately powerless in the face of God's plans. Even if it involves our demise, as it will, as we'll see in Stephen's life. Um, the threats and action, actions of our enemies are powerless in the face of God's plan. So trust God's sovereign plan for your life. God's principles are unfailing, and you can stand on them. Choose to obey God, just like the example of the apostles here in this passage. And then let me remind you of the third thing. Remember that our ultimate enemy is not flesh and blood. Our ultimate enemy is not flesh and blood. Ephesians 6 Verse 10, many of you know exactly where I'm going here with the armor of God. Again, one of my favorite passages, but I, I know you hear me say that often. Verse 10 says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Uh, let that sink in. It's our strength is in the Lord and the power of his, his, his might. Not us. It's not me. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For he wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So live like you believe that truth. You say, Brother Steve, how do I do that when people are being so mean and evil toward me, acting as if they're my enemy? Again, I would just bring you back to what God's word says. We are wrestling not against flesh and blood. You know, I was an enemy of God. There was a point in my life when I was his enemy. And when I got saved and born again, that changed. I'm no longer an enemy of God. I'm a child of God. And some of these people that 
may cause us great difficulty in our lives, they're enemies of God. And um, we have to be careful how we look at them because we were right where they were at some point in our lives. We were doing some of the same things they were doing, some of the same sins they were involved with. So we need to see them how God sees them. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. We're commanded to go, stand, speak, tell them the glorious gospel. And let the, let the power of the spirit that we go forth, forth in do its work in their hearts and lives. So our enemy is not flesh and blood. Stand in the power of the armor of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How are we doing time-wise here? 8 o'clock. A couple questions. Let's have a couple discussion questions here, and then we'll wrap things up here. Do you remember a time in your younger days when you did the right thing in spite of fear and apprehension? Anybody have a situation maybe came to mind doing the right thing in spite of legitimate fear and apprehension that you had? Josh. Not Eli. <laughs> So let me teach you instead of just give you the answers. That's good. Did the right thing. Right. Tony? Anybody else? This is not necessarily my younger, when I was really young, but uh, I had a period of time, maybe around 2010, I, about four or five years, I was able to go to the federal prison in Youngstown and minister there. I was invited in to teach a class on purity, and it turned into a, an every week or every other week thing for several years. And I got to know a number of the inmates uh, very well. And uh, it uh, turns out it was the, the place I was going was a INS facility. And so every single one of the 80 or so inmates that were in this one pod were um, illegals that had been convicted of some sort of uh, crime here in the States. And so they were doing their time. And then as soon as their time was, was finished, then they were deported. And many of them were Latin America, some were into Asia, and some in Africa. But I got to know quite a few of these guys. And... And I was new at this, and I, I didn't know some of the rules, and I was pretty naive, and, and uh, that most of the, the corrections officers don't want you to connect with the inmates too much because they know how an inmate can manipulate and try to get you to do things for them that would ultimately be illegal. And, but, you know, I started looking at these, these were my brothers in Christ, and I got to know them, and, and so many of them were legitimately saved, and they were growing, and you know, we were working together every week on, on discipleship stuff. And, and I had Doug Davis with me one time, and Doug came in, and he shared a story, a testimony about how he had driven off of a bridge. He's a truck driver for a lot of years. He had driven off of a bridge, and, you know, the truck is flipping. He's going over, and he's thinking, okay, these are the last seconds of my life. And somehow God had spared him. And uh, so he was sharing that testimony, and I had one of the inmates – come up afterwards and we were just kind of talking before we were going to leave the pod and he said I had something similar to that happen uh, to me and he said do you know where um, Portales New Mexico is 
And because uh, he was putting himself in Portalis, and he said he was just about ran over by a semi in the road in Portalis, but God miraculously had spared his life. And, he, and I said, I know exactly where Portalis is because my son lives in Clovis, which is probably about 20 minutes from there. And his eyes got big, and he said, my mom lives in Portalis, and she needs to know about Jesus. Would you go tell her the next time you're in, in Clovis? And um, I knew I'm not supposed to pass anything back and forth, but I said, would you write her number down, uh, her address down on a sheet of paper? And so I smuggled that out of there. And uh, a few months later, we find ourselves in Clovis, and uh, I uh, went and visited her. And uh, unfortunately, she did not understand any English. But she called a, another child, adult ch child, that was uh, able to interpret for us. And I, I bought a gift. It was around Christmas time. I bought a gift from her son in prison here in Youngstown and gave her the gift and said, this is Merry Christmas from your son. And it just kind of melted any fear away and any intrepidation, and we were able to share Jesus with her. And again, what a, that was a glorious thing where it was the right thing to do, even though it could have got me in trouble and I could never have been able to go back in there again. But I just sensed the Spirit of God was in that. And there, there are things like that will happen where we just trust God, that it's the right thing to do, and I'm going to open my mouth boldly. Any other things come to mind when you think about that? Ben? Opening a hornet's nest there, huh? <laughs> Yeah, none of us. Amen. Yeah, I always think that whole process is just kind of a test case to see by the enemy, orchestrated by our enemy, Again, we can put this on men, but it was the enemy that working behind the scenes to see, to kind of test how far he could go at this point. And uh, I think the good thing for us is that we learn from that test as well. And things that, that we may have done that we'll say, we'll never do that again. And so we've learned that, okay, we're on guard now. We're prepared. We're ready for the next test. And uh, so, yeah, that does go both ways. But, yeah, that's, that's a good one for doing the right thing. Ron.
Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Um, if you have anything else, come and tell me afterwards. But uh, we need to stop and pray because we have some pretty important prayer updates that we want to give before we uh, dismiss for the night because we need a lot of people praying. So let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer right now. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the endless lessons that we uh, find in it. Lord, thank you that it's alive. It's a living, breathing book that uh, is always fresh, always new. And so, Lord, show us what it is you want us individually to take away from this, the, the things we looked at tonight, other things you may have shown an individual here. Lord, help us to open our mouths boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, even if it means we may lose something or uh, be persecuted for that, Father, again. Help us to trust in you and what we know to be true. Again, Father, bless these people here tonight in this room, in this building, those that are watching online, those who may listen to this later. Lord, be exactly what they need during these challenging times we find ourselves in. Father, we love you. Help us to stand for you this day and every day going forward. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you didn't receive a prayer sheet, would you mind slipping your hand up real quick? We'll try and get you one. Just want to make note of a few important requests before we head out this evening. Everybody get one. If you didn't get one, would you slip your hand up? Over here. Perfect. Brother Jim Scully is with his brother Frank this evening. We have uh, wonderful news that Frank came to know Christ as Savior through much prayer and the working of the Lord. And so that's something to absolutely rejoice in. The flip side of that is that he, he is not getting any better. And they've put him on hospice care. And that's where Jim is tonight. And Jim doesn't, Jim doesn't believe that he'll make it through the evening. He's not sure about that. No one really knows how that happens, but um, of course he's asking that we pray and pray that God would give grace and strength to everybody. And we were praying for a miracle and the Lord may have decided that the miracle was for Frank to get saved and to be fully healed and to go home to heaven. So if you pray for Frank Scully, for Jim, I know he'd appreciate that. And then Charlie Haney's brother, this is Rick's brother-in-law, excuse me, this is one of... um, Rick's uncle's Archie Cook is his name, right? And uh, had a heart attack, right? And when they t- took him to the hospital, went septic. Um, so very, very serious situation. So let's pray for Archie Cook. And then Carol Carroll's in the hospital uh, with COVID and had trouble breathing and went in, listened to some of what her body was telling her. And it seems like they have it under good control. They're giving her intravenous medications and Lord willing, she'll be home We're hoping this weekend she'll be there. Uh, Doug Davis should be home today. I haven't heard confirmation of that, but we're praying that the Lord would give him the grace to do that. And then um, Mike Wagner has asked for prayer. He, again, has another UTI, and um, uh, there's only only a handful of drugs left that he is no longer resistant to. And so his body's building up resistance to all these antibiotics because of all these infections. And that's a discouraging thing. It's a challenging thing. And so I'd ask you to pray for that. And then there is a um, boyfriend and girlfriend. They, they're, they're adults. They're, they're dating one another. And um, they're friends of my wife, Kelly, and her boyfriend, Aaron. Aaron had, I believe, an injury that led to two brain bleeds and ended up in the hospital. And Kelly and Aaron, they're not believers, but Kelly reached out and asked Shannon if she'd come and wait with her at the hospital. And so Shannon had an opportunity to sit down with Kelly, who had a lot of questions, as you would expect an unbeliever to. And uh, Shannon was able to have wonderful conversations, and the doors really opened and got her a Bible and got her some, some other things to, to read. And so pray for Kelly, for her salvation, for Aaron's recovery. And then a blessing to rejoice in before we leave tonight. Uh, two more young people committed their lives to Christ tonight at the Good News Club, or this afternoon to the Good News Club. And so little, little Macy and Emmanuel came to know Christ today. So wonderful, absolutely wonderful to see the smiles on their faces. Any other requests that we might need? To, yeah, Tony, and then we'll get to Chris. Your brother? Yes. Okay, Tony's brother Angel's dealing with migraines, which are absolutely miserable if you've ever had them. So, yes, and then Kristen?
Okay. Okay, so we're praying for Mark and Morgan. They're being, she's being induced. Morgan's being induced right now, this evening, right? Praying for a safe, this is a miracle baby, praying for a safe delivery. Um, some complications, praying that the Lord bless us through it. Yes, Joan? Okay, so Jennifer Ballman continues to decline, uh, also on hospice care. Yeah, Pat? Okay, so Pat Thompson's. Okay, Pat Thompson's nephew has serious pneumonia. They had to remove part of the lung. It's in ICU. And this is in Virginia, you said? Okay, let's pray for him. Yep, yeah, Ben? Amen. So the prayer, the, the praise is that you have your house back now? <laughs> no, <laughs> the praise is that they all made it back safe and that they made it in too. That's good. That's good. Amen. Marvin? Sherry and Mary both have COVID. Oh. Pray for Sherry, Ballard, and Harry. They both have COVID. Yep. That's always a good sign. Yeah, uh, right. You know, there's, there's always like, there's always like a third time. And the last time I used it, my cousin went a little, the other two times did not work. And then my dad came over and, and touched the button, and then somehow it started working for him. So I think the obligation is. Sure. So, <laughs> so I don't know if it's going to work for him. Well, we'll pray for God to give you grace. Amen. For sure. For sure. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll pray for a few of these requests, and then we'll head out on our way. Josh, would you pick a few of these things out and lead us in prayer? Close out the service. Amen. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful evening.